Hello and good evening, my dear brothers and sisters. It is a great pleasure for me to be with you tonight. It would be, of course, even nicer to see you face to face. But as we all know, for the time being, this is not possible. And an online meeting is better than no meeting at all. The topic we have tonight is I am the Alpha and Omega. And this is the last address in this series of the great I am's in the New Testament. Before we go into details, I would like to pray with us. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for this occasion that we have tonight to look into your word, to read the Bible and to consider some of the glories of the Lord Jesus, your beloved Son. We do feel how weak and feeble we are and we ask for your help. We ask for your guidance, the guidance of the Holy Spirit that we need. And we pray for a rich blessing, that we might get new impressions about the greatness and the glory of the one who has loved us and given himself for us. We commit ourselves to you and to your guidance and grace for these moments that we spend together. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. I am the Alpha and Omega. And first of all, we are going to read some verses in the Revelation. First of all, Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Then we turn to verses 17, same chapter, Revelation chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one, and I became dead, and behold, I am living to the ages of ages, and have the keys of death and of Hades. Chapter 2, verse 8. These thing, things says the first and the last, who became dead and lived. And then we turn to Revelation chapter 21 and we read verse 5. And he that sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he says to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to him that thirsts of the fountain of the water of life freely. And last chapter. Revelation 22, verse 12. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward with me to, re to render each to everyone, to render to everyone it as his work shall be. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. I am the great revelation of what God is, the great revelation of what Christ is. 
You have been considering some of these great I am's, particularly those in the New Testament. But you get this expression I am already in the Old Testament, from Genesis to Revelation. The first time that this expression is found in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 15, where God says, I am the Lord. And then in Genesis 17, I am God the Almighty. And the last time we find this expression is Revelation chapter 22. I am the root and the offspring of David, God and man in one person. Now, whenever we read I am, we learn about the glory of God. We learn about the glory of Christ, be it in the Old Testament, be it in the New Testament. We like to speak about things that the Lord Jesus has done, that he has performed. And when a sinner accepts Christ as his Savior, Normally, the first thing he realizes it is what Christ has done. And I repeat, we love to concentrate on what Christ has done, what he is still doing and what he will be doing. And it is great, of course, to be occupied with what Christ does. But there is more to learn. It is not only what Christ does, but God wants us to learn who he is. And these I am statements do not speak so much about what Christ does, about the activities, but about his character, about his glories. Yet these two things, what he does and what he is, cannot be separated. They belong very closely together. If I realize that Christ saved me, I realize at the same time that I was in need of a Savior. Salvation cannot be separated from the Savior. If I rejoice that I am redeemed, and we do, we know we are redeemed because we have a Redeemer. You cannot separate, separate redemption from the Redeemer. If we have a look at the fact that Christ has reconciled us and one day he will reconcile everything to God, then this is only possible because he is the Reconciler. So these two things belong together. We cannot separate what he does from what he is. And yet we can focus more on what he has done or we can focus more on what he is. And I think the best thing is to have it well leveled and well balanced. Now tonight we have four titles of Christ, or to be more precise, we have four, a couple of what Christ is, four couple of titles. The first, I am the Alpha and Omega. Second, I am the beginning and the end. Third, I am the first and the last. And fourthly, I was dead or I became dead. No, I am living and I became dead. It's a question or a matter of life and death. The first three pairs are like a pole and an antipole. Alpha and Omega that belongs together. He is both. Beginning and end that begins to get, uh, belongs together and he is both. First and last, again, both applies to Christ. But he does not say, I am living and I am dead. But he says, I am 
living and I became dead. There is a slight difference. We will see that later on. To put the whole matter in a nutshell, before I would like to say this. Alpha and Omega speaks about the glory of Christ as the great revealer. Beginning and end speaks of Christ as the great fulfiller or the great executor. The first and the last speak of Christ as the great God. And the fourth expression, living and dead, speaks of his glory as the great redeemer. Christ is the great revealer, Alpha Omega. He is the great executor, beginning and end. He is the great God, first and last. And he is the great redeemer, living and dead. Now, maybe you think, well, Alpha Omega, first and last letter of the alphabet, uh, of the alphabet, the Greek alphabet, beginning and end and first and last, this is more or less the same. But if we look into the details, we will realize it is not exactly the same. These expressions belong together, that's true. They are like conjoined twins. We cannot separate them, yet we can distinguish them. And in each express, expression, we will find a, particularly, a particular glory of our beloved Savior. I am the Alpha and Omega. This is repeated three times in the book of Revelation. We have read these three references. Now, as I already said, Alpha and Omega are two letters. The first and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. Now, language is given in order to be read or to be heard. And that is the reason why I said this is Christ in his glory as the great revealer of who God is. If we have any knowledge about God, it's through Christ. There is a wonderful type in the Old Testament, and that is Joseph. Joseph illustrates the pathway of the Lord Jesus through sufferings to glory. And in Genesis chapter 41, we see the glory of Joseph, which speaks of the glory of Christ, the crowned one at the right hand of God. And Pharaoh gave him a new name. He called him Tzafnat Paneach. That signifies savior of the world, but the Hebrew translation is revealer of secrets. Now, who is the true revealer of secrets? That is the one who says, I am the Alpha and Omega. Wherever we open our Bible, wherever we read our Bible, we find Christ. And Christ is the one who reveals God. Of course, we can see God in his creation. And again, it's Christ who made everything, who created everything. But the true knowledge of God is through Christ and through his word. And wherever we open our Bible, I repeat, we find Christ. Be it in the Old Testament or be it in the New Testament. 
If we look into the law, the five books of Moses, we find a lot of hints, a lot of types and figures of our Lord Jesus. I just mentioned one, that is Joseph. Have a look at all the offerings in the Old Testament. They all speak of Christ. If we read the second section of the Old Testament, the Psalms, the poetic books, we find a lot of glories of Christ. The Psalms, for example, are full of Christ. If we turn to the prophets, the minor prophets, and also the, the bigger ones, so, so many prophecies, direct prophecies about Christ, the perfect servant, the one who will one day establish the kingdom here on earth. The Old Testament is full of Christ, Alpha and Omega. Wherever we start, wherever we stop, we find Christ. If we turn to the New Testament, if we, hear, if we read the Gospels, the Word became flesh. The Word, the expression of what God is, became flesh. Christ, the perfect man here on earth. We find his footprints, his pathway. We see him, the humble servant of God who gave his life for us at the cross of Calvary, wonderful Savior. If we read the Acts of the Apostles, yes, the book is called the Acts of the Apostles, but the, the very center of that book is Christ, is the testimony about Christ, the risen one, the one in whom forgiveness is preached to the whole creation. If we read the letters of the Apostles, the doctrinal part of the New Testament. It's all full of Christ, the one crowned at the right hand of God, glorified in heaven. It's all about Christ in the letters of the apostles. And if we turn to the last book, the book of Revelation, again, it's Christ, Alpha and Omega, from Genesis to Revelation, it's Christ. In this last book, yes, we have Christ, in his character as the righteous judge, Alpha and Omega. And dear friends, Christ is not only the center of the Bible, he is also the key to understand the Bible. If we don't use that key, we will never be able to open the books of the Bibles. They will be closed books if we don't use the key, which is Christ. And if we think about the Alpha and the Omega, there is another thought that is that all the promises, and that is an encouraging thought, all the promises that we get in the Bible, again from Genesis to Revelation, all the promises are secured in Christ. We cannot enjoy any blessing. We cannot enjoy any promise of God without Christ. When we leave Christ out, everything becomes like nothing. Take an example. We have received eternal life. We have it secured in Christ. We are children of God. We are sons of God. We have been called to adoption. We have these blessings in Christ. There is no blessing. There is no promise in the Bible without Christ. Let never leave Christ out. And the real enjoyment of these blessings, of these promises, is only then ours when we see how Christ is related to this blessing and to this promise, the Alpha and Omega. Now, if we have a look to what we have read in uh, Revelation chapter 1, 
the first time where we find this expression, I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Here we learn more about who is the Alpha and Omega. First, he is the Lord. Second, he is God, Elohim. And thirdly, he is the Almighty. The Lord, Jehovah, that signifies that he does not change. That is the great revelation Moses get, got in the desert when God appeared to him in this burning bush of thorns. And he said to him, I am that I am. In other words, I do not change. In the New Testament, that's Hebrews 13, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and in the ages to come. Wonderful. In a time where many things change, where people change, where everything seems uncertain, we know that rock of ages. I, Jehovah, I do not change. He is the one on whom we can count a hundred percent, even in a world where everything becomes more and more unstable. He is, secondly, God, Elohim, the creator, the triune God for us. That was unknown in the Old Testament. You get some hints, but the truth of the Trinity was unknown in the Old Testament. But if when we speak about God, we realize and we know that it is God the Father. It is God the Eternal Son. And it is God the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we say first person of the Trinity, second person of the Trinity, and third person of the Trinity. But there is no different level. They are absolutely equal, humanly speaking, same level. One God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then... The Lord Jesus says, I am the Almighty. That is also an encouraging thought. The one who is the Alpha and Omega, the one who has revealed God, is the Almighty. There is nothing too complicated. There is nothing too big for our God. But at the same time, there is nothing too small for our God. He is interested in all the little details of my life, of your life, this Alpha and Omega, this great revealer, the Lord, God, and the Almighty. So Alpha and Omega, the great revealer, of God. If we have any knowledge about God, we have it through Christ Jesus. And the Bible is full of him. The second title that we have found, and this title is mentioned twice in the book of Revelation, he is the beginning and the end. Now beginning and end, that means that he is not only the revealer, but he is also the great executor. He is the one who fulfills all the purposes of God, the purposes concerning the earth, and also the eternal purpose concerning Christ as the, and the assembly. The beginner, the beginning and the end, the great executor, the great fulfiller, the great operator, the great minister. Now let us turn for a brief moment to Colossians chapter 1 and here we see Christ 
the beginning and the end in a twofold way. First, with regard to the old material creation, and secondly, with regard to the new, to the spiritual creation. I would like to read, first of all, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, because, or even 15, he is the image of the invisible God, firstborn of all creation, the highest range, because by him were created all things, the things in heaven and the things upon the earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or lordship, ships or principalities or authorities, all things have been created by him and for him, and he is before all, and all things subsist together by him. When it comes to the first creation, the creation in which we live, heavens and earth, everything has been created by Christ. He is the beginning and the end of this creation. He is the creator. He created everything by power. And the Apostle Paul is using three different prepositions here. Verse 16, by him were created all things. And then we have another time all things have been created by him and for him. Although in the English translation, also in the German translation, it is twice the, word, the preposition by, in the Greek text there is a different preposition. There is a note in the Derby translation and that speaks about these three prepositions. I read what he writes, these three prepositions show Christ to be a, the characteristic power, second, b, the active instrument, and thirdly, number c, the end in creation. By him, that is his characteristic power, his person, he did it himself. He was not just the instrument, the divine instrument, but he did it in his own person and in his own power. Secondly, by him, the second preposition, he was the divine instrument to create everything God wanted to be created. And he's also the end, the target. The target God had in mind, he all things were created for him. It is for the glory of God, that is true, that everything was created, but it is also for the glory of Christ himself, who is God. He is the beginning and the end of this material creation. But when it comes to the new creation, he is also the first and the last, or better, the beginning and the end. Verse 18, Colossians chapter 1, And he is the head of the body, the assembly, who is the beginning, firstborn among the dead, that he might have the first place in all things for in him all the fullness of the Godhead was pleased to dwell. With, reg with regard to the new creation, Christ is the head of the assembly, beginning and the end. God has a purpose with this world, with this creation, and everything will be done by Christ. But God has also a purpose with Christ and the assembly. Ephesians chapter 3 speaks of this eternal purpose of God. And again, it is Christ 
who will perform, who will execute, who will do everything. And the day will come, Ephesians chapter 5, when he will present himself, the assembly, perfect, glorious, no sprinkle, no nothing, everything in perfectness. The first creation was created by power. One word was enough. The new creation, Christ and his assembly, became, became into, came into existence not by power. Something else was necessary. Christ had to die. He purchased us by his blood. God gave his only begotten son in order to have this wonderful assembly, this unity between Christ and his assembly. He is the firstborn from among the dead. He was dead. He rose again. He is living. And we are connected to him. The beginning and the end. God will reach his targets, all his targets. He will reach his targets with Israel. And the Lord Jesus will be the one to fulfill everything in the coming kingdom that he will establish here on earth. God will fulfill all his thoughts concerning the creation. And God will fulfill all his promises concerning the church and again he will do it in Christ let me read one verse in 2nd Corinthians chapter 1 verse 20 for whatever promises of God there are in him in Christ is the year and in him is the amen for God for glory to God by us. Christ, the beginning and the glorious end of everything. The third title, I am the first and the last. And I said, this means that he is the great God. Now, it is interesting to notice that this title is found three times in the New Testament. We have read these three references in the book of Revelation, but you also get this title three times in the Old Testament, in the, pro in the prophet Isaiah. And maybe we can read these three verses. The first is Isaiah chapter 41, verse 4. For who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, Jehovah, the first and with the last. I am he. Well, that is again a reference to the unchanging and everlasting God. Second reference is chapter 44, verse 6. Thus says Jehovah, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, Jehovah of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God, first and last, that is the great God, the eternal God, the everlasting God, the unchanging God. And I repeat what I have already said before, that rock of ages, the one who is almighty, the one who cannot be troubled, the one who is unchanging. And the last reference is chapter 48. I read verse 12 and 13. Hearken unto me, Jacob, and thou Israel, my called. I am he, I the first, and I 
the last. Yea, my hand hath laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand hath spread abroad the heavens. I am he. So this makes it very clear. The one who says, I am the first and the last. The one who is presented in the book of Revelation as the judge is no one else than the eternal, everlasting, almighty, and unchanging God. Before anything was, he is, and he will be still there when everything has come to an end. I mean with this old creation, the first and the last, the great God. Now we turn to the last expression, the last couple that we have found in chapter Revelation, chapter 1, verse 18. I became dead, and behold, I am living to the ages of ages. And this is repeated once in the book of Revelation. He is the living one. That is a wonderful glory of our Lord Jesus. What does it mean, he is the living one? That the first meaning is that he has life in himself and he has life independent of anything else. He is light and he is life. Or oh, light is in him and life is in him. He is the living one. If we compare that with us, there is a great difference. We also have life. We have eternal life. But we don't have it in independence. We have it contingent upon him who is the life, the living one. It is a great blessing that we have eternal life, but he is the eternal life. The Apostle John confirms at the end of his first epistle that he is the everlasting life. He has life in himself. And there is a second glory if Christ presents himself as the one who is living. He is able to give life to others. He is a life-giving spirit. This is an expression you find in 1 Corinthians 15 at the end, that great chapter of the resurrection. He is a life-giving spirit. If we have eternal life, and we do have eternal life, those who have believed in the name of the Son of God, that is a great blessing. But he has given us this eternal life, a life-giving spirit. We have been quickened with Christ. To quicken means to bring somebody to life. Now we have been quickened in him, not independent from him. I am the living one, and I became dead. Now, dear friends, this is something that touches our heart. The one in whom life is found the one who is the eternal life. He became dead. Why did our Lord Jesus became dead? Why? We know the answer. Oh yes, it is because of you and me, because we were sinners because we were guilty, because the judgment and the wrath of God was upon us. 
The wages of sin is death. We deserved that death. But Christ went into our death. He died for me, the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me, Galatians 2.20, that great statement of the Apostle Paul. He died for us. Yes, he also died in order to glorify God. He also died in order to take away the power of death from the one who had the power of death, to vanquish Satan. He died. He went to the cross, that shameful cross. He humbled himself. He became obedient, obedient unto the death, that shameful death on a cross. Dear friends, our Lord Jesus went into our death in order to redeem us. Oh, what a wonderful Savior is Jesus, our Lord. And how grateful should we be for what he has done. Now, when it says, I became death, we can, ask also, we can also ask the question, who made him to die? And there is at least a, a threefold answer to that question. Who made him to die? The first answer is we. We were his murderers. We killed him. When it comes to our responsibility, we put him to death. But that's not the main answer. But it's also true. And it brings shame upon us because we are guilty of having killed and murdered the Son of God. But the second answer is God gave him a ransom for us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And when it says he gave him, that does not only mean that he became man, but he gave him to die on the cross of Calvary. He did not spare his own son. Romans chapter 8. And the third answer, who made him to die? That is, Christ died himself. He has laid down his life. This is what he said. It was an act of willingness. willingness. He wanted to give his life and he gave himself. There are several references in the writings of the Apostle Paul where he says Christ gave himself. Now the death of Christ, the death of Christ is our victory. I am the living one and I became dead and behold, I am living to the ages of ages. If we remember Christ, we remember him hanging on the cross. We remember him dying there. But he is the living one. It does not say, I was the living one. He is the living one. And it is confirmed, I behold, I am living to the ages of ages. I am the Alpha and Omega, the great revealer, the beginning and the end, the great executor, the first and the last, the great God, the living one who died, the great redeemer. Now, what is the outcome for us? We'd just like to mention two things. The first outcome is there is no need to fear. You see, when John saw him, the judge, in his glory as judge, righteous judge, I fell at his feet as dead. The one who was in the bosom of Christ, the one who heard his heart throbbing, who was so near to him. 
and so dear to him, the disciple whom Jesus loved, he is at his feet as dead. He feared. He feared. But then the Lord Jesus, the great I am, he comes and he says, fear not. There is no need to fear the judge. Yes, the Lord Jesus is here presented as the great one and also as the judge. Great revealer, great executor, great God. But at the same time, the great redeemer. No need to fear. The judge took the judgment on him. And not only that, the judge is the one who loves us and who gave himself for us. So when we read the, the book of Revelation, there is no need to fear. And secondly, this is what we have read in the last chapter, 22, where again he says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, these three titles together. But in verse 12 he says, Behold, I come quickly and my reward with me to render to everyone as his work shall be. That stimulates our hope. To be occupied with the glory of Christ as Alpha and Omega, as beginning and end, as first and last, and also as the living one he who died. This stirs up our Christian hope to see him as he is. He will come back. Behold, I come quickly to fulfill everything that has been promised. We love to see him. Christ is our hope. Our hope is not just to be in heaven, not just to be in the house of the Father, but our hope is to be with Christ where he is. That is the house of his Father, of course, but the glory of that house is his presence. Our hope is a living hope. It is a blessed hope. It is a good hope and it is a better hope. These four characteristics are given in the New Testament. Christ, our hope, I will come quickly. Dear friends, are we waiting for Christ to see him face to face? I would like to conclude reading one verse in the gospel of in the first letter of John, chapter 3. And this is like a little conclusion of the whole matter of the great I Ams. Beloved, verse 2, 1 John 3, verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God, and what we shall be has not yet been manifested. We know that if it is manifested, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. As he is. That is the testimony of John. As he is. The great I am. What a moment will it be, dear friends, to see this great I am. As he is. Face to face. Now it is a matter of faith. We behold him, we contemplate him, we adore him, but all that is by faith. That is already a glorious thing. But what will it be when we will see him face to face for the first time? Our Lord Jesus Christ, the one whom we have served here on earth, the one whom we have followed, the one whom we have obeyed, our Lord, Jesus, the humble man, the one who humbled himself, who became man, Jesus, the name of his manhood, Jesus, the name of the one who hang on the cross of Calvary, Jesus, Jehovah is salvation. We will see him as he is. And we also see Christ 
the one crowned with glory at the right hand of God. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus, how great you are. If we contemplate you, we only see glories. One glory coming out of the other glory. And again, we confess that we are so feeble, so weak to see your greatness. But the little we already see and consider brings us to adore you for what you are. But we never forget what you did for us. You died for us in order to redeem us. We are so closely linked with you and the day will come. And we are looking forward to that moment, Lord Jesus, where we see you as you are, face to face, the great I am. And we ask you, we pray, Lord Jesus, come. We love to see you and we know you love much more to see us. Thank you for what we have seen in your word, for the impressions that we got again, fresh impressions of your greatness and your glory. Amen. Dear friends, thank you for your attention. I hope to see you again, face to face, if not here on earth, and we are not expecting that, then in heaven. But if not in heaven, then hopefully here on earth. I wish you a blessed Lord's Day in fellowship with him. Goodbye.